great introduction uh, to the private uh, life and the inward life of Rebecca Williams. My uh, duty this morning is to speak about the, uh, uh, the public, uh, Eric Williams. To me, it was intriguing when Ken spoke about the, the, the internal dimension of Williams, the loving man he called him, a generous man he called him, a hospitable man he called him, yet he reports that at the end of his life, he died a very disappointed man. He also speaks to the fact that uh, publicly he was perceived as being a very dictatorial person, very authoritative person, and I suspect for those who are going to be psychologists and those who are going to do psychoanalysis, the question becomes how do we reconcile those two versions of the person and are we indeed talking about the same persons? So in fact, there's a lot of work to be done. I thought this morning, though, as I listened to the conversation and as we sang God Bless Our Nation and, 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 and all those things, that if you were to ask me uh, what was the uh, principal achievement of Eric Williams at the public level, it seems to me that the task of Eric Williams was one, how do we construct a nation? In point of fact, this morning we began by singing God bless our nation, but all everybody want to be mum. You yeah, sing God bless your nation hard because indeed is your national anthem. And that to me was the great, the great, the great project uh, of Eric Williams. Uh, how does one construct a nation? A few points. Uh, one, in terms of the construction of the nation, a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, I had the pleasure of going to... Um, Mount Vernon in Virginia to the home of uh, uh, um, George Washington, who indeed is uh, considered the father of the American nation. And uh, uh, as I toured, it is in the bank of the, of the Potomac uh, in, these, in, in Virginia, I was shown the room to the left where George Washington wrote a very famous statement because, of course, he was the first president of the United States. He won the revolution. And when they asked him, when they came to ask him to run for the presidents and what he must do, and after the first term, he says, I walk on treaded ground. I walk on treaded ground. And part of the challenge of Williams is that he was walking on treaded ground. But Williams must not be seen simply as this genius who descended from heaven but part of a longer project in terms of the ongoing development of the nation. In other words, even as I see you know, the big controversy this morning or this week between the CJ and the PM and everybody is getting all excited and so on, it turns out that in terms of the construction of a nation, those are the challenges that one must face. How do these bodies respond to and represent one another? In a new work I am doing, I try to argue that when one talks about the nation of Trent Tobago, and I put out the question, when does one become a Trinbagonian? In point of fact, when does, if there's such a thing called modern Trinidad and Tobago, when does modern Trinidad and Tobago begin? Because as you know, we all came here as immigrants. If you look at the story of Eric Williams and his background and so on, it's a very mixed background in many ways. And the question becomes, how does one speak about this contemporary Trinidad and Tobago? When did it start? I argue in my work, and I shan't make the case this morning in a large way, that modern Trinidad and Tobago begins in 1900. And I use all kinds of uh, means of doing that. One, intellectually, for those who are old enough, I look at Little Folks Trinidad. I think it's a very important book in terms of when we become a, a nation, in the sense of talk, thinking about ourselves. Uh, in Trinidad and Tagore, where they think called the Panchayat, the first major Panchayat among the Hindus. Mr. Mr. Gordon used to be a big man, and then the Indian says, we shall control, and so on. Uh, Sylvester Williams, Pan-Africanist, comes from London in 1900, and he begins to talk about the construction of a nation, etc. I could go into all other kinds of indices, and thereafter, you've got a lot of guys like Murray Smith and Butler and Cipriani and others who began to talk about how do we construct this thing called Trent Tobago, and the only point I want to make that Eric Williams is one along that line of nation builders who did a lot to construct this thing called Trent and Tobago. Unfortunately, he did a lot, 
and there's much more to be done. And uh, one of the things I feel a little badly about is that we have not done enough, enough work in making students and our own uh, aware of what indeed are the demands of nation building. We make all kinds of great, again, the great big argument between Williams and his father. Obviously, the trend then was doctors and lawyers and so on. But again, things we don't talk about, that indeed Williams' mentor at QRC was a guy called Innes, R.D. Innes, who indeed in 1898 had gone out to Oxford, indeed had studied history, indeed had gotten honors in history, and when in 1901 he applied to QRC, they say, hey, we don't want no local people, he didn't get no work. Did not in fact get a job until 1915. And William says he was the one, I won't quote the whole thing, who was the most important man to me. He became even more important than his father intellectually and therefore said I was proud to go to his alma mater and study things like history. Because you understand the critical question is how do we know what we know? How do you construct a nation? How can you be a nation if we don't even know about ourselves? We are faced today with a problem, and I coming down this morning, I hear um, my boy on 102. What your name is? Oh, God, God, you're having a ball this morning, boy, cussing everybody. The CJ line, the PM line, what's going on in the, down in the country? Nothing is going on. What is going on is that the nation does not become a nation overnight. I'm reading, for example, Edmund Burke's work on the reflection of the French Revolution. And we see that conventions come in time because of crises. And how you respond to your crises, you go from one step further. When Eric Williams came to this country, we're talking about the public Williams. When he came to this country in about 19, but he keep coming on and on. In 1954, he came and gave lectures, a big famous discussion with uh, Don Basil Matthews. What were the challenges then? The challenges then is that we were a, a colony in the larger British colonies, we didn't control our affairs, we had no self-government, we were a bunch of colonials. And his first task was, how do we become uh, independent or free? The first challenge was the challenge of self-governance. Very first challenge. In fact, he did a whole big, a second, he did a number of pamphlets when he came here, one on economic, but the second one was on constitution reform. What was the new constitution that would take us from a colony to a self-governing territory? First challenge. I had a big fight with the British about that. Then, of course, it became cabinet government. And as you know, in 1958, we were talking about having a federation. And we wanted Shagaramas for our capital. He had to take on the British. And incidentally, the British and the Americans almost wanted to eliminate him and assassinate him. You'd find that information in Colin Palmer's new book called Eric Williams and the Making of the Modern Caribbean. The British, and particularly the Americans, were thinking about assassinating Eric Williams as he fought him for the base. So in fact, even though he was loving and generous, etc., outside he was a very stern man because his energies were diverted to the nation who became his children because he had the mandate to in point of fact how do I have these larger children in fact become a nation and so therefore not only was he stern and I wouldn't say he was dictatorial I would sort of not I would not accept that position I think he was very firm I think he understood that to build a nation there must be divergent points of views but when he took a point of view he carried right through what were then the challenges First of all, as we said, self-governance. Then, of course, self-governance came. He got 13 seats, rather, out of 24. How do I begin to get a cabinet and so on to construct the nation? So his very first challenges were, how do I construct this nation? What do I put into being to make the nation work? Of course, having studied at Oxford, as Ken has said, and having worked at Howard 
as Kenneth said, where he married his first wife. He was a tremendous intellect. I mean, no one would ever despise that. He's probably one of the most brilliant minds that the society has ever known. But again, there are other brilliant minds. And that's why what we're doing here this morning is so very important. Because we, including your professors and teachers, know nothing of the men like C.L.R. James and Oliver Cromwell Cox, etc., who have done so much to make us what we are. We glorify degrees and we glorify certificates. We never talk about self-knowing and self-knowledge. How do we know ourselves so we build a better and stronger nation? So we have the paradox as we make more and more money, we have more and more crime and we can walk down the streets. Because what we talk about is not so much the accumulation of self-knowledge and self-respect and self-love and self-concern. We're concerned, how much I'm making, boy, how big my salary is, boy. And we're making more and more and more and becoming less and less civil, etc., etc. And that's part of the contradiction. Because part of the contradiction was, how do we, is it constructing the nation? Williams did the best he could. Brilliant scholar, capitalism and slavery, uh, from Columbus to Castro, and all of those marvelous things. And of course, he did as he could have done. Then, of course, we talked about independence. And he came, and of course, independence came, as you know, as a result of the failure of the Federation. And Williams fought tremendously for a federation, whether it be a, and there were some concerns about what were the uh, freedom of movement of people and so on. And so his first challenge, as it seems to me, was in terms of that uh, creating a nation. But in creating a nation, there were two major concerns. In point of fact, there's a one concern of how do you define and protect minority rights? Because the way you define a nation is how do you define not the rights of the majority, but the rights of the minority. And in fact, when he and uh, Kapil Day uh, went up to London at Marlborough House to talk about our constitution, they had to come together and make certain kinds of concession. And with that, Williams, of course, at that time, he was a tremendous listener, even though he was deaf, <laughs> but he knew when to listen. And he listened to the people, and they tried to construct and say, how do we move forward together in this nation? But I've argued in another context. At some point, I think Eric Williams, as great as he was, ceased to listen for all kinds of reasons. I shall not go into the reasons right now. And when he ceased to listen, the bounds and boundaries between the governed and the, uh, those who are governed and the governors we begin to have a breakdown in those two areas. And therefrom, we had to decide where do we go. And in that circumstances, with a tremendous upheaval in terms of the February, Revo the February Revolution, in terms of what they call the, the Black Power Revolts. What did that really mean? And how did he handle it? Now again, uh, as I said, uh, Ken has written a wonderful book on the elusive Eric Williams, but a wonderful, another very important book, which I just reviewed for the Journal of British Studies, is a book by our Colin Palmer called Eric Williams and the Making of the Modern Caribbean. And to really see Williams operate at the private level at that moment of challenge to the nation tells you how very strong he was. And what is very important at that important moment, he realized that even though we had won political office and won independence, that in point of fact, the black people of the nation, in fact, had not realized the kinds of promises that, of course, in terms of jobs and so on, and you have this very black, very large revolution. Now, those could argue, and some have argued, that as a result of uh, foreign uh, pressures, you have uh, Steve Biko taking place in South Africa, you have Stokely Carmichael, United States, and those pressures. But obviously, even though we had won political independence, even though we had self-governance, even though we had cabinet uh, formations, that in terms of the melding of the nation had not quite taken place. And out of that came a wonderful document called uh, his document on the Chagaramas Declaration. Again, if you look at the public, Williams, a number of important documents that you must have and should know. One, of course, is the People's Charter. And the People's Charter comes in 1956 when, in fact, the nation is being put together. There's another marvelous de de uh, document, Perspectives of Our People, of Our Party, when he talks about the role of the theoretical leader and the political leader. Then look at something called Masa Dunn. 
And you must know if one of his speech was uh, no damn dog back, but then the other one is master they done. We can control our own affairs. But then the Shagarama's declaration sought to say, here are these currents at one level you've got communism or socialism. On the other level, we've got capitalism, of course, where the market's supposed, this is Shelton, you have to be very careful about that now, where the market should be ruling. And how do we meld these things together? And of course, they introduced something called the people's sector to say, for example, that people must participate in their own development, which was a very important move on his part. But thereafter, one would begin to probably argue that things begin to kind of go downhill in terms of holding the, the, holding the center. And so that Eric Williams, at the public level, was concerned about nation and nation building. How do you construct a nation in light of a lot of important things that are happening, particularly in light of what's happening in the outer world? There are times I've heard people argue that somehow it was inevitable that Williams would come into power and that some of the circumstances were correct to have Williams come into power. But I don't know if that's very true. Again, Ken would show you, and I said in my book, when Williams came into power or he began to prepare for power, he worked like a dog. Within the period when, of course, September, I think, when the PNM was launched, and of course, the elections were held by 56. It had been about 187 meetings throughout the country trying to convince people about the importance of constitution reform, economics. He worked very hard. Yet, of course, he recognized that, and that's why I think Ken would argue that at the end of his life, is a very disappointed man. Uh, a lot of people have argued that he was very disappointed at the end because he said that the people had not responded in certain kinds of ways. But again, the paradox, if I am the prime minister, I've run the country for 20 years, and people disappointed, wherein do you lay the, lay the blame? Who is to be blamed? Well, it's certainly you did one job probably good in one area, and probably the other area you probably failed because you can't have it two ways. And it certainly seems to me that part of the problem in building the nation is sort of building a nation for what? I've been asking the question in terms of education for what? Where as a nation, where are we going? And one may argue that even though Eric Williams is a very intellectually brilliant man, I think tremendous foresight because when he wanted to talk about Eric Williams, the, the wealth that we enjoy today in terms of Point Lisa, another thing that happens when he came into power, we were a sugar-based economy. All right, and he had the foresight to shift from a sugar-based economy to be an energy-based economy, which you see at some ways that place like Point Lisa. So to the, today, we are one of the wealthiest nations in, I guess, per capita because of his foresight. So he understood that man shall not live by sugar alone, but of course, go and do something with the oil. But at the other level, the question is, what happened at the internal level? We have a number of problems. In fact, when we look at the notions of what's happening today, how well prepared are we for what's happening today? And if, in fact, we look at the indices of development, I mean, certainly in terms of per capita, we've done well, very well. When we look at the level of social development, we have to say, where did we go wrong and what it is that Williams did not do? But this morning is not what he did not do. It's to acknowledge the fact that he was among, I'm going to speak in two moments, is to acknowledge the fact that he was amongst the most brilliant of us. And brilliant in the sense that he understood he was a, tre a tremendous devotion and commitment to his work, sometimes almost at the expense of other things. Second point I want to make uh, this morning is to say that he is not someone who came from the skies. He's part of a longer process and has been the culmination of a process that had begun much longer. His, it seems to me, was the process of creating and constructing a nation. And what do I mean by a nation? I could probably give you a definition of a nation and uh, what it would probably mean, how do we come together, not only as a people, but a nation, as a group of people, having, just let me just read one brief definition of a nation. Very important scholar called Stuart Hall, who does a lot of work on things like modernity, and I'm concerned about modernity, when do we become a modern nation, etc. And of course, Hall argues that what constitutes a nation, or what is a nation, he says, is a sense, you bring a paper and thing, you're taking notes, 
students, no notes. Just come. All right, nice. All right, nice. All right, all right. All right. He says, in fact, a nation is a sense of belonging. People have a sense of belonging which draws people together into an imagined community and creates symbolic boundaries which define those who do not belong. In other words, precisely because we have 1.3 million people and we will never meet the 1.3 million people, how do we know we are Trinidadians? Well, certainly at the very first level, we, t we have to imagine the community. A fellow called Benedict Arnold did a very important book called Imagine Communities. Think of a society of 20 United States, 240, 280 million people. How do they know their nation? You will not meet 180 pe a million people. So you have to imagine. And how that comes, he argues, through your newspaper and print media and so on. But the sense of belonging to one, one unity, having the same kinds of goals, etc., is what would mean a nation mean. And that is why Eric Williams was so concerned about all the groups. I don't accept the fact that he was racist in any way. I think as the father of the nation, he was concerned about all of the groups and how do you meld all those groups into one whole and having one common destiny. We know soccer does it. We know sports does it. I mean, we are going to go to the World Cup and everybody's eyes going to be glued on the World Cup when you see that red and black and whatever. We all are going to be Trinidadians. But in the absence of that, how do we construct a sense of ourselves having what we call our own self consciousness that we belong here and have things in common rather than things that divide us. William's major concern was how do we construct a nation. I think the third thing about Eric Williams, when he came in my mother's time, she was a servant working for a white woman and thing, clean out kitchen and thing, and he made our people proud of themselves, proud to be Trinidadians and Tobagonians who could hold themselves uh, their heads up high wherever they went. He gave us a sense of ourselves, a sense of pride in who and what we are. When he says, stand up and be counted, stand up and be strong, he gave us a sense of our peoplehood. And he did that in a very important way. He also told us that indeed there could be no mother India, no mother China, no mother Japan. Of course, that's a contradictory statement again. But you have to understand at the moment when he said no mother India, no mother whatever, Chinese, no mother Portuguese and so on. What it really meant at that particular historical moment that we had to come together as one. But even in that, as he was a loving father and a dictatorial leader, it's also contradictory. Because you cannot come together as one if you have not resolved the problematics of your own specific being. In other words, if you're not sure you're African or you're not sure you're Indian, you can't come together as one unless you have resolved your own problematic. He left that at part of the project to be done. In other words, he set out certain kinds of tasks, and some of those tasks still need to be done. And most importantly, it seems to me, he left us a very open state. They could still cuss one another, they still cuss man in the papers, right? Nobody ain't going to jail yet. I could still go down to the Mid City Mall and go to a UNC meeting. They don't throw me out yet. Because what he has left up is an open political culture where we are free to criticize one another and yet nobody ends up in jail. You couldn't do it in Jamaica. You couldn't walk down to Ava, one kind of color go down there at all. Forget Haiti. Are you working in Haiti? So you know the thing in Haiti. Those are Williams' achievements. And I'm only afraid that we all take it for granted because everybody having their own good time. You don't care about if uh, Wednesday and you're going along and doing your thing, but we must understand that the person who laid the foundation for those freedoms and for the kind of nation we have is Eric E. Williams and no one in Trent Tobago, no one in Trent Tobago could say they are a learned person or an educated person if you have not read Eric Williams. You cannot say, I don't know how we measure being learned and educated uh, here, different kinds of concepts. You know, the European nations, the way in which they constructed nationalism they constructed nationalism through history and literature. Say so you go into Americans, so you got to do the history. You go into English school, you got to do literature. You got to know who's Milton and Spencer and all them fellas. And we learn it here too. Well, we want even Englishmen. 
but they're creating Englishmen, so you have to learn Spencer and Milton and all them fellas. All right? Because the way they constructed your devotion to your nation was through your literature. Everybody here did Twelfth Night or Milton Paradise Law, so everybody here do Shakespeare. No more Shakespeare than you night ball. Why? Because the English had a project which was a national project that says you shall know me better than you know yourself. And so the way you construct a nation is through knowing about those who have gone before and given you a mental map or something of the signpost of the nation. And therefore, it seems to me that if you're going to say, and this goes particularly for the younger students, go for the older ones too, is that what does it mean to be educated? And we go because William's major concern, as we said, was on education, the massive education system. What does it mean to be educated? Rather than possessing a skill, eh? we have good people in financial thing, and all the financial thing and the economic thing and thing and thing and thing. And they know the medical thing and thing and thing with Max Shine. But that's to possess a skill because my mother was also a, a, a surgeon because she's a chicken in the yard. And when the chicken foot break, she put two stick and wrap it up. Dies medicine too. So she was skilled. Oh God, my little nephew said, push, I go, I go, I'm done in two minutes. <laughs> she do me tight, ting, ting. I'll finish, I'm done, I'll come in the end. But what being educated really means is being, how does one relate responsible and respectfully and purposefully to one's nation and one another within that commune of people who are constituting themselves into a nation. And to do that, you must know, I also started with self-knowledge, you must know about those who try to articulate the demands of the nation. And I end by saying, if you do not and have not read Eric Williams, either one of his books, and you have not read C.L.R. James, either one of his books, and you haven't read V.S. Naipaul, either one of his books, then it seems to me that the Williams project of building a nation would not have been satisfactorily fulfilled and it should remain divided until and unless we come.